Hi, hello. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, some of you might have noticed I was supposed to give this talk last year, uh, but unfortunately I was not able to travel to St. Louis because the COVID travel restrictions were still in place. So uh, Strange Loop and Alex Miller were so kind to just like re-invite me again for this year. So I want to say a big thanks for making this so easy and possible for, uh, for me. So I want to talk about the field um, of data-driven investigations. Um, last year, I would have said this is an emerging field, but a lot happened in the last year, and I would say, like, actually, like, it's not so emerging anymore. It's quite there. It arrived in human rights and in journalism. Um, my name is Christo Buschek, and I'm based in Graz in Austria, so it was a long flight to come here. And I'm a programmer and I'm an investigative data journalist. Um, I work for the Spiegel, which is like a weekly German newspaper, uh, and I also work for like Paper Trail Media, which is an investigative organization based in Munich in Germany. Um, and in the past, I was more involved with human rights, but over the last years, like I transitioned a little bit and moved more into journalism. But to be honest, like uh, for me, there's not much difference actually. From where I'm standing, actually, the type of work uh, is very, very similar. And so I feel like I still want to think I'm swapping between the different fields, and these uh, fields also blur, like the lines between them blur, so it's not so um, uh, separated anymore. Um, and what I do primarily, day in, day out, is like I develop tools and methods for data-driven investigation. So when we, data is something that is around already a long time. Journalism is using data for, for many, many years. Um, in the 50s or 60s, it was called computer-assisted uh, reporting. So that's a very old term. We don't talk about this anymore like this. But we used to use data more for like, uh, census data to, to support political reporting or to like uh, cover like elections and stuff like this. Uh, the same is true for human rights defenders. Uh, uh, collecting data and documenting human rights uh, violations is like the core of what human rights defenders often do. And I think like the term human rights violation documentation, which is a very long term, it's basically, it means collecting data. But what I want to talk about is something that shifted, so now we can talk about data-driven, and that's something else. I feel like data-driven means like we do the investigation not by using data, but we let data drive the investigation, and it makes it possible for us to uh, conduct investigations that were not possible before. Um, you will also see sometimes the term computational methods. I think it's very accurate, but like I, uh, from experience, I know as soon as I use this word computational methods, journalists are just like, they put up their hands and they walk away, they don't understand anymore. So I stick to the term data-driven investigation. Um, so how I got here. So there's like a lot of like uh, um, history there in data-driven investigation. So I want to point out like a few investigations or projects that were like relevant to my uh, um, 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 way. And so I want to start with the Panama Papers. Some of you might have uh, heard about it, but the Panama Papers were like a huge leak. Uh, I think it was 11 or 12 million documents from like a lawyer's firm in Panama. Uh, and based on these documents, uh, journalists were able to reveal like how the rich and the powerful managed to like hide money, uh, get it away, launder money, like even criminals, and how to not pay taxes basically. Um, this was a big thing back then, and especially for journalists, it was not easy to manage 12 million documents. Like, journalists did not have this amount of data before. And so they had to learn, like, on the spot and, like, very, very quickly how to deal with this. Um, but it paid off because, like, the Panama Papers, I think they were released in 2016. They're still uh, useful today. So investigations still looking today into the Panama Papers and new things are coming out from this trove of data. Another story I want to highlight is like uh, was published in ProPublica, uh, Machine Bias. Uh, it was published by Julia Engwin, Jeff Larson, uh, Sue Yamato, and Lauren Kirchner. And they were examining something that is called risk assessment scores. And these risk assessment scores are very much in use like in uh, the US judicial system. Um, and what they supposedly do is they assess the likelihood of a defendant to again become criminal. So if this rings any alarm bells, you're absolutely right, you, it should. Um, and what ProPublica did was like to show that, um, that these scores are very unreliable. So only 20% of these scores actually were like uh, uh, fitting, like uh, the, the, 
uh, it was not very well done, but also that uh, these scores perpetuated a lot of like social uh, racial biases. Um, so, for example, these scores label like black defendants more likely than white defendants to become criminal, uh, and white defendants were labeled as low risk more often than black defendants. So what is interesting about this story especially is that like uh, this is a very technical topic and in order to investigate it like uh, journalists had to become also very technical and develop their own tools and software in order to like understand what was happening here. Um, the last project I want to show like is the Syrian archive. So this is very personal because like I used to work many, many years in the Syrian archive, and I actually wrote the software to do um, the collection for the Syrian archive. The war in Syria, um, it's, it's interesting in a way, because it was the first war that we ever experienced. It was like thoroughly documented from the point of view of the people who experienced the war. So until then, like war was always documented from the outside, like journalists moving into the field, making photos, make, taking video, or like the army producing uh, uh, material. But this time it was different. It was the people who experienced the war firsthand who actually created the material, took the photos, took the videos, and uploaded them to platforms like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, what have you. Um, and this was like an um, incredible amount of data. Like, uh, uh, so with the Syrian Archive, um, uh, the Syrian Archive was one of, one of the organizations that uh, stepped up and started collecting this data. Um, in total, we collected, I think, like until now, like over five million different videos, hundreds of thousands of Facebook messages, Telegram messages, tweets, uh, private documents. Like, uh, it's a lot, a lot of data. Like, I think we're talking about like 20, 30, 40 terabytes of data just documenting the war on Syria. And it is, in fact, the largest collection documenting the war in Syria. It will become. I think it will become very important in terms of like digital memory and, and for generations to come to actually understand what happened in this war. Um, but so while we were able to collect a lot of this data, it was so much data we were not able to handle it. Of these five million videos, we maybe verified a thousand videos. We don't know what's in the data actually, like for the biggest part. Uh, we did not have the techniques and we did not have the tools to actually like work through this amount of data on a level that we as human rights defenders uh, could actually like uh, make a statement about it. Um, interesting enough, also like a lot of this data does not exist anymore online. So while this was uploaded to platforms like YouTube, um, uh, I think 20 to 30 percent of this data was taken down by now, and the Syrian Archive holds the the, the only copy of these. Uh, um, uh, witness reports. So, where are we today with data-driven investigation? So today, uh, things change. Like we got better. We as a community got better. And also, if you follow the um, um, the war in Ukraine, you will notice that like uh, a lot has happened. And like now, uh, open source intelligence with techniques like open source intelligence, um, uh, we are able to analyze and and work through the war almost in real time. So that's new. We were not able to do this in Syria, but we're able to do this now. Um, there's a lot of like that happened also like in terms of like organizational support. Newspapers recognize the, the, the value of these techniques and pretty much every big newspaper tries to like catch up or introduce this as like a, as a standard way of investigating. So there's a lot of examples from the Xinjiang police files over the January 6 visual investigations, uh, the downing of MH17 in Ukraine. Like there's a lot of like uh, uh, examples where like data driven investigation techniques were used to actually like uh, figure out what actually happened. Um, so why does it matter? So why is data-driven investigation valuable? Um, I, I think there's a lot of reasons, but I want to highlight three of them that, that will become relevant later in, in this talk. So the first one is like um, we are able to work on issues safely without having to be there. So before that, like if you wanted to, for example, like document like a, a, a genocide or like war crimes, you had to go into the area, which was very often like very unsafe, and the amount of reporting that could be done like this was very minimal. But now, with a lot of these like data techniques, we can be somewhere else and do this investigation, and also as well, like we can investigate something where we cannot get access to either. So that's also like very very valuable. Um, Data-driven techniques also give us the ability to not only use data that already exists, but we can generate or create new data sets out of other data sources. So that's also, like I think, one of the differences between like how data was used in journalism like 
10 years ago and now is that like we not only use data that's already available, we use data to create new data out of it. Um, and also very interesting is like that you can, while like individual stories and individual experiences are very, very important, but if you want to show the scale or how systematic something is happening, then data is very useful for us as journalists as well. Um, in order to do data-driven investigation, um, different things have to happen. And I think the most urgent and the most important one is that like, different fields have to come together in order to do this. So I, I'm a programmer. I alone cannot do data-driven investigation. It requires the expertise and the background of a lot of different fields that really have to come together as equals in order to conduct this as a, as a technique and as a process. So I want to highlight just four, which are very common, but like there are more, like um, uh, technology obviously is very important when we talk about data and computational methods. Design is important because we have to understand and communicate what this uh, is about, and we have to also understand it ourselves. Storytelling, like we have to tell a narrative around it, like the data itself doesn't say anything. We have to put it in context. And of course, investigation, like this is like getting to the bottom of something. But this also allowed a lot of people with very, very different backgrounds to join investigations, uh, archaeologists, uh, architects, uh, artists. They're all becoming part of like a bigger uh, field that like now like come together in order to do this kind of investigations. So I want to present like one investigation a little bit in depth that I did. Um, uh, it was an investigation into the um, um, network of detention camps in Xinjiang. Uh, but before I go there, like a little bit of a background. So Xinjiang is a province in uh, China. And over the last few years, China uh, conducted a campaign of oppression in Xinjiang. Um, the campaign is targeted uh, primarily uh, against Turkic Muslims, including the largest group, the Uyghur. Um, this campaign includes like force, forcible assimilation and uh, several organizations and nations has been called a genocide. Um, this campaign is very thorough, so it includes like mass surveillance, uh, biometric uh, registration, uh, and limitations of movement for the local population. Um, additionally, a large network of detention camps was erected in, in the whole province, and it is estimated that over a million people uh, disappeared in these camps. Um, so the Chinese government claims that these camps are part of a re-education program, but there are like witness uh, reports of former detainees that uh, report about like torture, abuse, um, and forced labor in these camps. Um, there's, uh, there are also reports about uh, women being forcibly sterilized. Um, and this campaign is ongoing. So when we started this research, um, some of these camps were known to us, uh, but, and we only could speculate how much more there was. We did not know, like in the West there was no uh, information about this, and we could also not like go there. We could not travel to um, Xinjiang to take a look uh, ourselves. Um, so this project is called Build to Last. It's a series of articles that were published on BuzzFeed News, uh, and it's a collaboration with Mega Rajagopalan, an American journalist, and Alison Killing, an architect who is based in Rotterdam, and me, um, a programmer. Um, so what we did in this series of articles is we developed a methodology in order to like systematically find those uh, detention camps and we combined them with like uh, personal reports of former detainees uh, in these camps and that's the series of articles were released uh, based on this. Um, uh, so what came out of it is like we could find uh, 348 locations. Uh, bearing the hallmarks of prisons and detention centers in Xinjiang. Until this point, maybe like 20 or 25 camps were known to us. Um, we could corroborate some of the locations, uh, many of the locations, through witness testimony um, and government documents that contain the addresses of these camps. Once we knew where they were, it was easier to find them, actually. Um, Alison Killing, who is an architect, uh, could measure the space the sheer size of these camps and could determine that like the, sheer si like, the size of these camps could like hold up to a million people. Um, interesting also like uh, the output of this work besides the series of articles is also again a set of data. We published the data set and other investigators, journalists and human rights defenders could use this data again to continue their own work. So 
when we started, we didn't know much, right? So Mega was, uh, uh, was a journalist who was uh, sta uh, like, uh, located in Beijing, and she was one of the first Western journalists to report on one of these deten detention camps. She heard about this, she drove there, she took photos, and she published a report. As a reaction, like her visa to stay in China was not renewed, and she had to leave. Um, but she still wanted to find out like, more about these camps. She wanted to know how many are there, where are they, how big they are. Um, so in summer 2018, Alison Killing got involved, and she was an architect with a background in, in analyzing satellite imagery. Um, satellite imagery is interesting because it's a source of information that comes from outside of China, and therefore is not under control of the Chinese government. Satellites are, there are many satellites that are under control of like US or European uh, organizations. So where do you start such an investigation? We start with like not knowing anything. So we have to develop a methodology to actually get to a point. So there, is, there was this photographer, Jonathan Browning, and he found that like on Bairo Total View, which is kind of like the same thing as uh, Google Street View, uh, the Chinese government is censoring certain industrial complexes. So this, for example, is a photo of like, I don't know what it is exactly, and on Bairo it looks like this. So some fun um, censorship. This is another example. This is like a factory or like, I don't know, like a power plant. This is how it looks like on Biden maps. <laughs> so this censorship looks very, very clumsy, and indeed it, it is very clumsy, but it's still there. So Alison had the idea to maybe look at like on Biden maps on the map and see if maybe like detention camps are censored as well, because like that would make sense. And indeed, she found it. Like um, she went to Baidu Maps and she started zooming in, and she recognized that at one certain zoom level, uh, suddenly, like a white tile appeared uh, above, like one of these um, uh, detention camps. Um, and then she zoomed out again, and it was gone. And she zoomed in again, and then it was uh, censored again. Um, so we tried this manually. Um, and we could determine from six camps where we looked manually, we could uh, determine that five of those were censored in Biomap. So we thought like, wow, this is something. Like, uh, uh, this is like maybe like a method. Um, it is interesting that like, even though the censorship was very clumsy, but just by the fact that the Chinese government was censoring on Biomaps, they actually revealed to us like the detention camps, or the location of the detention camps. Um, so how does this uh, look like? Um, this is how uh, you can see like how the censorship actually looks like in practice. Um, you can see like um, there are satellite tiles. So a tile, like a map, like Google Maps, Bible Maps, the same way. They build up like in tiles of 256 pixels, squares, and then they just render like one tile next to each other. And so some tiles were masked, they were just like white tiles, and some were watermarked tiles, they were just like there was no information, and some were uh, um, satellite tiles. So this is like uh, the three types of tiles that we had. So once we could determine this, that this works manually, the point was like, okay, can we really like systematically look throughout the whole province of Xinjiang on Baidu maps and find these locations that are censored as a first step, as an indicator to know like, okay, maybe this is a place worth looking at. So this is where I came in, being a programmer. Uh, Megan Allison asked me if, if that's something I could do, and I wrote like a program, a scraper, to do exactly this. How this program looked like, it was really just like uh, automatically starting a browser, loading Baidu maps, and then like automatically just like dragging the map from left to right, and just like trying to find, like just like go through the whole uh, of Xinjiang. Um, in order to do this successfully and to prevent being blocked, I had to like be a little bit creative, and so I had to like pretend to be a human, even though I was not. Uh, so I was just like scrolling two times to the right, then I stopped, then I scrolled back, then two times to the front, I waited 10 seconds, and I waited one minute. It's just like really, just like pretending to like not be a machine in a very machinic way, but it was good enough. Like, um, uh, it doesn't take much to actually trick these like detection systems. Like, uh, so if you do this just like in a very automated way, the scraping, normally you get blocked very quickly. But if you're like a little bit just like irregular, it, it's fine normally. Um, 
Um, the biggest uh, difficulty he had to building the scraper, like the scraper itself like, was quite easy. Like, of course, you have like, Google Chrome and you have Puppeteer and you can just like, do network inspection. It's like the web is like, fantastic for these kind of things. But the difficult thing was like, the infrastructure around it, like in order to run the scraper successfully to the end. Uh, there was like, a lot of issues around like, error handling and like, restarting scrapes when they stopped. Um, and the resiliency of the scrapers were, was difficult because Bidomaps, like in the West, Bidomaps is not fun to browse. Like, uh, it doesn't work half of the time. Um, so this scraper was running for one and a half months in total on 25 machines at the same time. And I know that like uh, a lot of people who work as programmers, this doesn't sound like much, and it, I agree, but like uh, it was something for like my little world. Like, um, um, so the output of this scraper was like over 50 million tiles, like locations of tiles. Um, and of those, five millions were masked, censored. So this is still like too much for us to look at, like five million locations, like we are busy like uh, 10 years and we are not done with it. Um, so if you want to run a detention camp or any kind of such a, a, a infrastructure, logistic is a problem. Uh, having grown up in Austria, like of course, like I grew up with like a lot of like uh, reading a lot about like uh, concentration camps during the Nazi regime. And one thing that the Nazis were always very, very eager on was like uh, to get the logistics right. Like uh, this is also something that like, that was the most important thing. Everything else could like collapse, but the logistics was running. So in order to run logistics for a camp, you need infrastructure. And so we thought like, okay, if you want to run a camp, it has to be like in or close to an urban space. It needs connection using like uh, highways or streets or like railways. So we took these like five million tiles and we cross-referenced it with like geolocations of like infrastructure and reduced again the set of data that we wanted to look at. So out of this came like still like 800,000 uh, locations, but we thought that's much better than 50 million locations. So maybe we can get started with this. Um, so this was the first step um, in uh, doing this investigation, we went from not knowing anything to a point where we had an indicator of 800,000 locations where we thought this is worth looking at. And so the next step would be like to look on satellite imagery there. So very, very important for data-driven investigation is something that is called verification. Um, uh, verification is like if you look at data, you have to annotate it, you have to classify it, you have to make a judgment call that this is really like what you're looking at is is... Uh, correct, and that it's really like what you think it is as well. So this is a process of verification. Um, it is slow, it re requires accuracy, and it requires a lot of context. Um, you can really think of verification that like you expose data to a due process, and this due process you have to define or like uh, think about upfront. Like uh, you have to set your methodology first, um, and then you can verify your data. Um, so I'm going to show you this. This is how I built, like, as a second part of my uh, this project, I built like a UI just for the verification. The first iteration of this UI was really just like you can imagine it like a Tinder profile. Just show one location, you say left, right, left, right, left, right. The goal was just like to really like sort it out quickly, like just get like a set of data that was worth looking at and and uh, look for the low hanging fruits first. But you can recognize in this uh, screenshot there's like several things of like what makes a camp a camp. And we had to develop this language, and this uh, UI was then reflecting the, uh, this language as well. So this is how we went. So through uh, starting with nowhere, we found a methodology to find like indicators of where to look, and based on this data set, we could then actually produce the data set we were really interested in is a set of verified like locations of like locations, and we could like prove this with satellite images. Um, I want to show you how this actually looks like. Um, um, let's see if I can do this. One second. Is this working? Yeah. So um, I don't see it myself, so I have to do it a little bit blind. So. Um, Google Earth is a fantastic tool if you're into satellite images. Um, so this is a camp uh, in Dabancheng. It's close to the capital of uh, Xinjiang in Rumkim. And one second. Oops. It's very hard to do it like this. And here you can see the camp. Let me close this. 
So this camp consists of two parts. The upper part, the larger part, can probably hold up to 30,000 people. The lower part is a more high security uh, part um, and can hold up to 10,000 people, we, we think. Um, interesting, uh, you can also uh, go historically back uh, using Google Earth. So if we go around, you can start seeing like around 2019 that like they start building the camp. There's nothing there before. Um, in 2020, we can already see the camp being pretty much finished. Um, so what makes a camp a camp? So I want to look at this one specifically because I'm going to also show you like uh, this camp then from a different view later on. So you can recognize several things here. One is you can recognize like the walls around it. Um, you can recognize like guard towers in the middle of the walls and at the corners of the complex. Here you can see like the actual like uh, uh, facilities that probably hold the prisoners. You have an entrance gate up here. This building down here is probably like a, a building that uh, hosts like uh, police or prison guards. And you can recognize there's like a little connection to the wall here. So we think that this uh, wall is being manned from the outside, not from the inside. Um, you cannot see it so well here, but here you can also recognize um, the shadow of barbed wire. Um, so this is something you have to be lucky as well. So it depends on the atmospheric conditions if you can actually recognize this or not. But these are the things that uh, Allison was really looking uh, for. Okay. Let me see if I can go back to this. Um, so when you look at this from, from above, you start to be like a little bit distant. Like uh, the, how it looks like, the aesthetic of such a camp becomes very abstract. Um, so it is very, so how does a camp actually really look like? You don't know when you look like just from above. Um, so luckily, there was this Chinese blogger uh, with the name Guang Guan. And he actually took a, the list of our camps and he said like, well, journalists cannot go there, but I can because I'm in the country already, and I will take videos of this. And this was incredibly brave, because some of these camps, uh, um, he had no reason to be there. If he would have been caught, he had no plausible deniability of why he was there. So he took this video, and I would really like uh, um, I recommend to watch this. It's on YouTube. It's around 20 minutes. So I'm going to show you just like one part of it, and I think I'm a little bit conscious of time, so I will go through it. So this is the camp uh, in Debanchang which I've seen it. And so this is a video that he took. So he arrived from here on the side and basically filmed it like coming from this side. So in the video, we can recognize some of the things we've seen before from like above on the satellite imagery. We can recognize uh, the yellow box is like a surveillance uh, uh, cameras. Uh, the green box are like uh, uh, the housings for the inmates. The red box is this like a uh, guard house that I showed you before that is like uh, located outside of the wall. This is a second uh, example I want to show you, and I want to show you because just like also to understand like the scale of these facilities. So the video will start like in the top uh, uh, corner and will go all along this uh, large street. Um, this detention facility, uh, the length of it is nearly a kilometer. Uh, we think it can house up to 10,000, 11,000 people without overcrowding.
科路用百度地图测量工具测的长度约一点一公里。从建筑规模来判断，这里应该关押了非常多的人。这里应该是乌鲁木齐市地区规模最大的集中营区域。这里注意建筑物损伤的标语，隐约可见“劳动改造”“文化改造”四个字Yes, yes. <laughs> he left China and then he published the video. So I don't know him personally, but he's safe as far as I know. So again, we can recognize several like uh, attributes what, of like what makes a camp a camp. Um, I've been told this says like these letters, this character says uh, says like labor reform, cultural reform. I cannot like read it myself. I've been told. We can again like recognize like several like uh, uh, identifiers of like a detention camp. So. Coming to an end now, like I want to talk a little bit like okay, what it means like from a technological point of view, being strange loop, of course. And and so I always talk like about method and methods and tools. I think like methods are actually the more important one. We have to find a way how to approach them, and then we have, the tools have to follow. I think it's uh, tools are very necessary, and like very often when I talk to people, they immediately the first question is like, oh, do you have a tool for me that I can scrape Twitter, or do you have a tool that I can do this? And I'm always saying, well, what do you want to do actually? What is it that you want to do? And I think you first have to think about this and how you want to get there and what is important to you, and then you find a tool or you make a tool uh, to make it work for you. Um, the methods are also very, very interesting because pretty much every good data-driven investigation publishes an article as well a how we did it kind of article. This is very, very important. When I started working in this field, like many, many years ago, uh, these articles, these descriptions of how people got there were very, very uh, enlightening and important to me. And uh, uh, the methods are the interesting. The methods are what stays, the tools will go. Um, when you run like such a data-driven investigation, there's a lot of ways how you can approach them. But like I think this is like uh, something that like uh, happens very very often. Like it's steps that you have to go through. Um, you can go back, but if you go back, you have to do the steps again. If you verify something and you go back to preservation of data, you have to go through verification again. Like you cannot skip something. It is very important, in, especially if you want to tell a story that is like factual correct. Um, but I think it's like preservation, exploration, verification, and narration that are essential. And of course, you can vary, and depending on the story or the project, like you can like play around with it. But this is something that like um, worked for me quite often. So, um, building technology for like data-driven investigation is not the most uh, exciting one. Like I hear people talk about like large distributed sy systems and AI, and I don't know what I, I don't even know what this all is. But very often, it's like very simple things that I have to do, and and they get me very very far. But there's uh, certain like uh, consequences of the tools and the methods that we use that I think are very very interesting. And it's, I think the first one is that like the tools that we use also shape us again. Like it is very important to not forget this. Like uh, uh, the tools that we choose will also limit us. Like depending on the uh, tool that we have, like we either like allow certain social structures, certain communication channels, or like certain ways that we can uh, work around it. I also think that we have to like. Um, Build our own tools. I think that is very important. I think, like we, ca I at least, I cannot just take a tool that was built for business intelligence. I think there's like a mismatch here, and the tool will just not fit. And then, like, I can either choose to continue using the tool and change the premise of my project in order to fit the tool, 
Or I can say, like, I want to keep the premise of my uh, project and change the tool or build a new tool in order to uh, align here. I also don't think that technology is neutral. Once a month, at least in Hacker News, I read a comment that says, like, all technology is neutral. It just matters if you wield it for good or bad. I think this is nonsense. Uh, technology is always coming from a certain position. It always has a culture. It expresses power relationships. It expresses choices and values. Um, I also think we have to create our own values if we build these tools. And I think, like, one... Um, uh, and I also think like this mix between human interfaces and programmatic interfaces is very important. Like both are equally important. Like I work with a lot of people that have to access the data and annotate, but I also want to like uh, make their life easier. So I need machines to annotate and work with the same data. And and sometimes like people will annotate one piece of data and the machine has to access the same thing. And this process has to be as fluent as possible. Um, so. In my environment, human rights, journalism, like uh, I'm very resource constrained. Um, budgets are a problem very often. Like uh, until recently, I had very rarely a budget to do technology work at all. Actually, um, um, also like very specific about like building technology in my field is like very few people will use this uh, uh, software. The UI I showed you before, like it was used by one person. I always say like if three people use my software. I'm a pop star, like it's, it's uh, but that's very normal and this is also like what I tailor for, like I really try to focus on like, I have one, two, three people who are gonna use it, the tool is for them, for nobody else, so it's, it's optimized. Um, I was speaking a little bit about values and I think like these four values are very, very important to me. There can be more values in the tools but these are pretty much always on the list for me, like uh, it's security, so it's the security of the people who have to use the tool. It's the security of the people who are expressed in the data. It's privacy. We have to protect as well as the people on the, uh, that is, are represented in the data as well as the people who are doing this uh, work. It's accuracy. We have to be correct. We cannot be wrong when we publish a story. And it's context because data, uh, data without context, without like, uh, setting it like, in place, is just information is pretty meaningless to me. And also, like, uh, maintenance is killing me, so I try not to do it. Um, and so, this specific thing, so I try to, like, come up with, like, a fancy name for it, and I've, I, I think I found a very fancy name. So, I call it ephemeral tooling. Um, so, what I want to express with this is, like, that this is, this is born out of necessity. It's not, like, because I want to, but it's because, like, I, I couldn't do it differently. Like, maintaining these tools is really hard, and so what I do instead is, like, I build a tool, Greenfield, I start from scratch, I run the project, I use it one time and I throw it away. And then for the next time I start again. And this is actually like much easier and takes less resources and less time for me because like these projects are short lived. They don't run for like three years normally. Like if, if, if it would, then that's the wrong uh, approach. But like it works for me. So my last thoughts, and they're totally unsolicited, but it's just like something that I came to realize for myself or that I learned from, from me. So first one, it's not about me. Building technology is really not about me and it's not about like my craft, it's not about like the purity of good code, it's not about like uh, imposing what like comes out of my field, imposing it on my peers, on journalists, on human rights defenders. Uh, it has to be like a conversation, it has to also more often go the other way than actually um, from the technology to other people. Um, the second one is that even though I'm a technologist, and this is where I come from, I'm also an investigator as well. I don't, I don't have just one identity, I have multiple identities in this uh, uh, project. Uh, I see myself as a journalist, I see myself as a human rights defender, I see myself as a programmer as well. And I have to combine these different identities in order to be successful. It allows me to communicate with people, and it allows me also to actually do these investigations, understand what it's about. And these are just like the two things that I feel like I learned for myself. And thank you very much. If you want to get in contact, this is my email address. I prefer email. Since a week, I'm on Twitter. So if you want to clumsily follow me in real time how I don't understand Twitter, feel free to join me. Thank you. So the question was uh, where we got our satellite imagery from. So we use Google Earth primarily, but we also had like, contact with uh, Planet, uh, who provided also satellite imagery. Um, so the question was, uh, it's like how I think victims deal with what they experience in these kind of situations, be it war in Syria or not. Um, so 
I'm not a specialist in this, but there are people who are working in a field that's called transitional justice, and I find it very, very interesting as a field and as a, as a way. We think of justice always as a punitive uh, thing. We think about we put people into prisons and we punish them for what they did. But transi transitional justice actually tries to achieve something else, to try to recognize what happened, and this recognition is what allows people to move on. There was like a few years ago like a, a court case against a former Guatemalan dictator. He is a really old man, I think he's 90 by now. And, but they still put him in front of a court, and he was uh, um, uh, sentenced guilty for crimes, genocide against the indigenous uh, population. I'm not familiar with the details, but he was sentenced guilty without a punishment. It was, the goal was like to basically allow people to tell the story and to also like have a way that they can like, that it's recognized what they experienced during this time. That's why I think also like initiatives like the CERN Archive will become very, very essential in the future because this is the experience of people and these experience will be important in order for people to come to grip with it. Yeah, so the question was like, uh, why did I end up building these tools? Why Megan and Allison came to me? Um, because I think I was around already for a while. Like, so I was, I'm working in this field since 2015 or 16. I started like by accident, actually. Um, and so I met Allison at an event similar, something like this. And so we just knew each other. We were not like close, like we don't, didn't know us very well, but she knew that I was around. And so then she just emailed me and said like, well, uh, do you know someone who can do this? And I was like, mm, yeah, I do. <laughs> and that's how it started. And that's how it uh, starts very often. Like uh, all my work in the past actually was based on this kind of like uh, encounters and, and networks. Yeah. Uh, so the question is like, how can you scale this kind of visibility and how can you actually like uh, turn this into change, like have it impactful change, if I understood it right. Um, to be honest, I don't have a good answer. I'm not into policy, and, and that's a world that is like very alien to me, and so I better leave this to other people. But what I think, or what I understand for myself, is like that um, people who do policy rely on people, journalists and human rights defenders, in order to give them uh, arguments and, and uh, opportunities. Um, and, and so pressure did build. Like, uh, of course, you can see it as a uh, you can see it as a failure that like uh, the situation hasn't changed, but still like the pressure is very very high, and it's very like forefront. Pretty much everybody knew something about what was happening in Xinjiang. Uh, four years ago, that was not the case. For example, so the question was like how to conduct such an investigation securely and and um, if I understood right, uh, yeah, so. I think, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do, like on the digital security level, but also just like on a human level. So journalists have like a long uh, history and understanding of like how conduct investigations safely. But on a digital level, I would also just say one thing is that like you always need a copy of the data yourself. Data disappears, and I think that's why preservation for me is always the first step in such a process. If you want some data, you always need your own local copy that you can work with. You can never rely on any kind of platform on the internet to have this data or to keep this data online. And a lot of this data, like once, like for example with the scraper, like we had basically like one chance to get the data. We didn't know how long, like, so the way that I wrote the scraper, it exploited like a specific implementation detail of how censorship was implemented by Baidu Maps. And, and then like a few months later, I tried the scrape again and it did not work anymore. Not even, I, th I don't even think they tried to like stop it. It's just like I think they continued programming something on Bidu Maps and this specific thing that I could exploit for myself was just like not working the same way. And so I didn't look closer into it, uh, but it's just like uh, if we didn't have the data already, we would have maybe uh, issues and couldn't finish the, the research. One last question, maybe I always prefer people in the front, so maybe I ask one totally in the back. <laughs> Um, so the question was about the reliability of data. Um, so you mentioned social media. Um, social media is not reliable. Uh, pretty much data coming from Twitter or, or anything like this is garbage most of the time. Uh, the, the way that you go about it principally, and this, accounts, uh, this is true for social media as well, is like you uh, develop a process of verification and you go through it. It's only like... Um, only if you have like a, only if a piece of data is verified, you can actually uh, use it. Um, so this sounds very very difficult, and it is. But uh, the good thing is often you don't have to verify all data. So for example, like the Syrian Archive published a, a, a research into like the use of chemical weapons in Syria, or they also like. A, 
published research about like uh, the bombing of hospitals in Syria, and then maybe you have like one event and you have a thousand videos for it, right? You don't have to verify a thousand videos, you have to verify maybe 10 videos that like uh, support your case, that like, allows you to then like make a statement that is a fact. And if you have these 10 videos, you can move on and you can verify the next event. So you can throw away 990 videos maybe. Maybe they're interesting for other people, but for your case, it's good enough maybe. One last question, I think, or? And then we're done. Please, go, go ahead. Yeah, it's not a question. I just want to say thank you because it's very personal. I, I was born there. I live most of my adult life 10 miles from the pictures we showed there. My parents are still living there, still alive. So thank you. Wow. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>